Over the 23 years I've known Jennifer, I've been proud to call her my law school study partner, my professional colleague, my outside counsel and conciliary, my bridesmaid, my friend, and my sister. But tonight, I'm proudest of all to call her the president of the HNBA. Please welcome to the stage Jennifer Salinas. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for those kind words. I have more about you in our relationship later. Now, I know that I'm keeping you all from drinking and, more importantly, dancing, so I will try to be brief. Bear with me. Um, this world is a crazy place, right? And this country, despite what's going on right now, is an amazing place to live. Where else would it be possible for someone with my background to be able to stand before you to take the reins to lead the Hispanic National Bar Association? My mom, an undocumented Mexican immigrant that came to this country at the age of 14 to work in the fields, and my father who dropped out of high school to go to Vietnam. I got here because of people like you, yourself, taking a chance on me. And I hope through my stories tonight, you will be inspired to effect the same kind of change and make a commitment to truly transform someone's life. My hope is that everyone leaves here clear on their purpose and inspired to act. This thing is driving me crazy. I've asked and I've been asked how I will measure my success. And I know in my heart of hearts that it will not be my deeds. As Maya Angelou said, people will not remember what you've done, but they will remember how you make them feel. I hope that your experience this year will be a positive one and that you will be inspired to act, to go outside your comfort zone and do something truly altruistic. Take a stretch, make a stretch that will really help someone. So here it goes. I used to tell my kids that the two things you need in life to succeed in this country are skill set and work ethic. Their eyes are going to roll over right now. They've heard this speech a gazillion times. The reality is if you don't have the skill set, your strong work ethic will only get you so far. And if you have the skill set, but not the work ethic, well, your career is going to be short-lived or not very fulfilling. I recently added a third thing that you need to succeed, especially now. You need the opportunity. You can be incredibly bright and have the most amazing work ethic, but if no one gives you a shot, it really doesn't matter. So those are the thing, three things I want to talk to you about today. And I promise you tonight, they'll be brief. I'll try to be anyway. I want to share these stories with you in the hopes, again, that I inspire you. I've been told that my personal story, and thank you, President Mason, for encouraging me to do this, uh, is, is that. So I have to warn you, my, my story is deeply personal. And I share them not because I want you to feel sorry for me. I absolutely don't want you to feel sorry for me. But instead, I tell you my personal stories because I hope it resonates with some of you. And for those of you who doesn't, doesn't resonate with you, maybe you had a very different life and experience, I hope you have a better understanding of how hard it is for some of us to get here and how much we desperately need your help. Years ago, I was at a USC, I was at USC as part of their street law program. For those of you that don't know what the street law program is, is that they bring in young high school students into a university and have people like, that look like them, uh, professionals, to talk to them and hopefully inspire them uh, to pursue a higher education. I was about 10 years out of law school. I was giving this my standard spiel and I looked out to the audience and saw these really uninspired faces. At that moment, I decided to just ditch the script and go very deep with these kids. Now, this was a terrifying decision, kind of like it is right now with my new employer. <laughs> my colleagues were in the room, and they only knew that I came from a bad part of LA. That was pretty much it. So I took this risk because it was more, it was not about me, it was about these kids. Those children were suddenly engaged, asking questions, shooting up their hands, and after we were done, they formed this incredibly long line because I spoke to them. Like I said, you need three things. So let's start with the first, work ethic. This part will be short. 
My work ethic was both nature and nurture. You see, I had a grandmother and mom that hate, hated laziness. To the Latinos in the room, you can appreciate that being called a huevon or a huevona was a terrible thing to be called. I hated this word, and I was called this all the time. When I wouldn't get up early to mete el vacuum, limpia este cochinero. My grandmother, my mom, my tias, and my tios worked tirelessly, and laziness was not going to be tolerated. As an aside, the conflict that working moms have about whether to work or not to work was never something that was a conflict with us, because working or not working was never an option. This is an affluent problem. My work ethic was also derived from a very painful part of my upbringing, and this is a hard part to talk about. I grew up in a violently abusive home where drug use was prevalent. And although we left many times and sometimes we were in hiding, my mom always returned. Quite frankly, she didn't know her rights and she certainly didn't have the resources to leave. And although that was a terrible experience in my life, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell, if, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that that actually molded me to who I am. You see, I was desperate at a very young age to never be in a situation where I felt stuck, where I couldn't take care of myself and my children. It resulted in a very type A plus, 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 plus personality. I control the things I could. So when my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Cannon, told me I was smart, I was stunned. I never heard that before. I didn't know I was smart. I knew my family tried their best, but they never had the time to acknowledge my schoolwork or tell me I was doing a good job. Now, the few times that they did tell me or notice that I was smart would kind of go like this. Mija, don't be sad that your sister is pretty. You're smart. Not exactly the kind of confidence-boosting words, you know, that I was looking for. But it was Mr. Cannon that took notice, primarily because I was getting the highest math scores in his class. Now, Mr. Cannon was old and old school, so it often went like this. That's really amazing for a girl. <laughs> I knew then that math was a great equalizer. It doesn't matter how well you spoke. The reality is that you could do well in math, despite your maybe language limitations. I learned quickly that science was the same way, and I fell in love with both. I also, well, until Dr. Cron and AP Bio, the um, science part started. Anyway, Mr. Cannon did something else. He gave me the idea to be a lawyer. You see, there was a classmate of mine named Hu Ching. Hu Ching had just come to this country from Cambodia, and she was relentlessly teased and beat up. You can imagine the names that she was called and the terrible things the kids would say to her. Now, no matter what my dad was, and he was deeply troubled, um, with being bipolar, a disease that we knew very little about at the time. He did teach me some great virtues. As ironic as this may sound, helping others was one of those. In fact, I was fortunate that the three people responsible for raising me, my mom, my grandmother, and my father, were all incredibly giving and would take the shirt off their back to help anyone. And I remember many times them pulling over the car to give a homeless person food, and we were dirt poor. I learned early on in life that the purpose of life was a purpose-driven life. Now, so when I saw Hu Ching, Hu Ching being picked on, it hurt me, it affected me. I immediately came to her rescue and I started walking her home. Now, I was in fourth grade. There's a whole other story about why in the inner city at fourth grade I was walking her home, but whatever, that's for another week. I loved going to her house um, because I would help translate the paperwork for her parents. Now, I didn't speak Cambodian, so this was really charades, okay? Uh, and you can imagine how awkward it was when I had to explain sex education in the fifth grade. That was quite interesting. But the reward always came with a great homemade meal, and I'm sure my love for Asian food started then. Anyway, the reason why I bring up this story is because that's where my advocacy started. I was constantly defending Hu Ching, not just to my classmates, but Mr. Cannon. 
he would never explain things slow enough for her to understand, and he would tell me to stop, stop arguing and sit down and stop being her lawyer. I don't know what he was talking about. So um, this lawyer thing stuck in my mind, and he said it all the time. Now, I didn't just stop there. I really always defended the underdog, and someone, um, someone with a big mouth in the inner city doesn't always go so well, and I have the juvenile record to prove it. I mean, suspension record. Don't worry, there's no criminal charges. <laughs> so I went through this, through life, really a, a double life. I was a very studious kid, studious kid, but I had this internal battle going on at home and that I never talked about at all with anyone. But the motivation for my hard work was to escape an abusive home. I, for whatever reason, kept my eye on the prize. No matter how bad it got, and it got bad, I didn't run away. I didn't leave. When my sister ran away at 15, I was tempted. She left to my grandmother's to even a worse neighborhood and worse schools, and I knew I had to stick with it. I had to get out of the system. I had to break this cycle. And I knew I could get out of it. As crazy as this is, it was my fourth grade teacher who was in my mind the whole time. That one person changed the course of my life. This white man in a predominantly Latino and African American community changed my life. We're on the border of Paramount and Compton. I'm not quite sure why he was there. But the reason why I say white man, because in this world of divisiveness, I really want us to remember that there are some amazing allies out there for us. And in fact, most of the people that have helped me through my career were not from our community. The reason I tell you this story is because one of my objectives, one of my goals, is to make us a bigger presence in our communities, starting at the very, very early ages of elementary school. I don't want, my role model, the only people I saw out there, certainly on TV, was Speedy Gonzalez. Do you guys remember Speedy Gonzalez? <laughs> really? Um, now, we, I'm proud to announce that we are going back to the roots of the HMBA. Now, there, we've done some amazing things, and we've had some amazing programs, and I don't want to discount that at all. But Alva was so happy to hear that when I said, less is more, less is more. We're gonna focus our efforts really on the pipeline like we've never done before. We're gonna focus on the kids and we're gonna focus on the community as I promised Judge Reyna I would do. So the first thing we're gonna do, and you'll hear more about this uh, in a newsletter I'm putting out in a few weeks, is we are going to reintroduce Judge Reyna's La Promesa en el Derecho program initiative, the promise and the law and give our communities the tools they need to fight the attacks that are currently on, going on against them. This is really personal to me. When I was in law school, I worked at a public interest law firm and I would spend two days a week at a women's shelter. This was really hard. I would see these kids and I just wanted to take them home. One day a week I would spend going to the projects and handing out leaflets, telling renters what their rights were. So when Judge Reyna asked me to reintroduce this program, it was a no-brainer. It completely aligned with everything I believed in. Justice Sotomayor has said, we educated priv privileged lawyers have a professional and moral duty to represent the underrepresented in our, in our society to ensure that justice exists for all, both legal and economic justice. I know, I have felt, I know that we have this moral duty. It has always been ever present in my life. I want to make sure you understand and you accept this moral duty and that you come along with us. Our mission in the HMBA has always been more than a bar association. If you're interested, I'm not going to read it to you, I promise. You can go look on our website and you can read it and you will see that it's not just about the lawyers. It's never been just about the lawyers. It's about our community and advocating for them. Now, I don't want you to think I've abandoned our lawyers. I haven't. I know that we need to move the needle, but we need to be in our communities as well. 
So, like I said, I spent, there were three things I was gonna talk about, right? Work ethic, and I've wove that through my story and, as, and how it's um, my main objectives for the year. I've talked about um, skill set, a little bit about math and science, but I wanna talk to you about opportunities because I would be remiss if I didn't talk to the law firm partners and in-house counsel in this room who have an opportunity to affect change. I'm not gonna waste that opportunity. You met Chelsea earlier, and you heard about how she, about our relationship, and we had good times, and we had not so many good times. We would fight vehemently about who was right. Footnote 13, Patterson, in my mind still to this day, many years later, is there. Um, Chelsea did so much more for me. It's an understatement, even though we didn't have, she didn't have a, a cadre of lawyers in her family, she had been around lawyers. And she shared with me the playbook of how to succeed in law school. I didn't know what outlines were. I didn't know what she was talking about. A law school was law school and college was college. I didn't even know what rankings were. I didn't know that was important to get a job. I'm like, well, I'm here, right? I mean, what is... And she told me about that right off the bat. She didn't have to share this with me. I was the competition, but you did, and I want to thank you for that. Um, the reason why that's important, I, I do want to hit on this one issue because it drives me absolutely crazy. I went to San Diego State University and I loved my school, don't get me wrong. I love my school, but it wasn't the best school I got into. I chose my college because that was close to where my boyfriend was. <laughs> that's it, I liked him a lot. And um, he later became my husband, I have two kids, he's not my husband anymore, but anyway. I, he. Um, Sorry, but, um, but I want you guys to really understand that you, there's so many assumptions that are made about where someone went to undergrad. I didn't have any guidance. I didn't have a family members to tell me don't go there, that, that you may not have as many options if you go to a state school as opposed to other schools that I got into that were far better. No, they were like, well, of course, he's gonna be your husband. We're Latino. I got married at 19. Um, so I tell you that because I want you to look behind the paper. I want you to ask questions to, to draw out why someone made the choices they did. When I chose the law school I went to, I didn't choose the best law school I, I got into. I chose the law school that was closest to my mom because I had a baby and I needed her help. So I want us to stop making assumptions about people based on pedigree. Because guess what? I graduated at the top of my class. Smart is smart. Now listen, I don't want to discount anyone that has a Harvard degree or Stanford, Robert Maldonado. <laughs> I just want to make sure we do some digging, that we do some diligence, and then we just don't cast judgment based on what's said on a paper. Now, I promised I would wrap this up, so I'm actually going to skip a bunch of pages. And I know this booklet looks really scary. It's just because I, I'm a terrible eyesight, even with contacts, so it's really big print. Um, I just want to mention a few, I'm going to kind of short circuit this, I want to mention a few um, mentors. Um, you know, I had a colleague, Russ Hill, I don't know if anyone in this room knows Russ Hill, he was in a tragic accident a few um, months ago and he's now a paraplegic. It's crazy how life turns out sometimes. And I was hoping that he was gonna be here when I decided to actually talk about him and then this tragedy happened. And I told him I would send him this part of it. But Russ was a colleague of mine and uh, he had a great client by the name of Lenovo. Now, he brought me onto his team. Now, we were peers. So this was, anyone in the law firm, does any, any of those law firm partners over there? Um, 
he brought me in, and that was a huge risk. He risked the relationship. He knew that Rachel Adams, who was um, in charge of litigation at the time, would get along with me, that we had similar personalities. And so he risked his relationship to do what was best for his clients. And he didn't care about origination credit or any of that. So when he went in-house to another company, I was positioned to take over that relationship. And well, the rest is kind of history, right? <laughs> 10 years later, I'm here at Lenovo. Now, mind you, um, I still had to prove myself to the client. I still, it's still, it's still meritocracy. Um, but I just want to bring that up because I want to encourage law firm partners to do that, to share, to introduce people, to not have it just be about you. And I wish Rachel was here because I wanted to thank her for that. I mean, she, we got along right off the bat, and she's intense, I'm intense, so it could go both ways, as you all know. Um, the next person I want to thank, I had a bunch, a long list, but I'm not going to do that to you guys, I apologize. Um, I want to talk to just two more people. Uh, Judge Reyna, I want to thank you for just, um, just giving me the confidence. I mean, early on, we hit it off. Judge Rain is also intense. <laughs> um, and he just saw in me, just, you know, he just gave me encouragement. And, and that, I mean, he's a federal circuit judge, uh, federal circuit judge, and I'm an IP lawyer. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing when you have a federal circuit judge recognize your talent. Um, and it meant a lot. It really did. I want to thank you for that. Um, I also want to represent, re recognize Michelle Eiffel. Is Michelle Eiffel still in the house? Is she still? There she is. Now, Michelle Eiffel is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel at Verizon Corporate Services Group. I met Michelle several years ago through a women's network, who are all here. Where are the WEN ladies in the house? It's a great women's network. Um, the first time I met Michelle, who's also intense, we hit it off, and she learned I was an IP attorney. I took a bold step and said I would love to do work for Verizon. Within a week, she had her executive assistant reach out to me, and she set up a meeting with her IP team. Now, obviously, I still had to pitch the case and convince the IP team that I had the goods and that my team had the goods, but she did that. And again, I told you I wanted to encourage the partners in the room and the in-house counsel in the room to take those kind of bold steps do what you say you're going to do. Don't, don't just talk about your diversities. Actually live it, walk it. I was told I say that wrong. I don't know if that's right. Live it, walk it, whatever. Anyway, I always got those idioms wrong. <laughs> right, Mom? <laughs> um, so I just want to encourage you guys to take those steps. Take those bold steps. Again, look, look behind the, the pedigree. Do what you say you're going to do. Make those connections. I mean, we need people like that to really move the needle. So I was going to go into specifics about my year, but I know I'm keeping you from dancing, and I, and I know I'm keeping you from drinking, so I just want to do one thing before we end. I want to thank my family. So four years ago, I met this amazing man who asked me to dance. I said no. <laughs> He persisted. <laughs> now, this was in New Newport Beach, California, and there aren't a lot of Latinos in the room, okay? So I think it was just two of us. <laughs> I noticed he moved different than everybody else, and I knew he was not from Orange County, and neither am I. So when he persisted again, I had to say yes, and we danced the night away, and, um, and then two years after that, I married that hemp man. Oh, he has a name. His name's Gabe Salinas. <laughs> He's my biggest advocate, my biggest supporter, my biggest cheerleader, and I wouldn't be able to serve my community without him. Now, all the women in this room know that Gabe's an amazing man. He takes care of us every glam session, right, ladies? No, you cannot have him. Stay away. Anyway. Um, the next um, two people I want to recognize are my children, my kids, my, my boys that I birthed, my Neil, my baby, my little Neil, who I went to law school with, who's 24 now, and Anthony, my monkey, because Latinos, we always have nicknames, and you guys all know that, right? Pelochino, flaco, feo, anyway. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you boys so much for all your love and support, especially when I was a single mom. You made my life easy. It could have been very difficult. I'm very, very fortunate to have raised some amazing young men. Men of integrity, men that give back to our community. Now I have my stepdaughters, Emma and Tessa. Oh, you poor little Latinas. <laughs> I am constantly in their ear, constantly, right? <laughs> About this world and what you need to do. And I want to thank you for always supporting me. I mean, they are like, anyone messes with me, they want to, anyway. They're strong and they're strong Latinas. And I want to thank you for just always being there and loving me and most importantly, for sharing your dad with me. And, um, my mom is going to kill me for this. She is so going to kill me for this. But mom, I want you to stand. To my mom, my matriarch, I have no words to thank you for coming here to this strange country, for me, for my brother, for my sister, for our family, for your future, for my future. Thank you for never giving up. Thank you for having the strength to leave an abusive relationship. For believing in yourself to start your own business after you raised your kids, that's pretty amazing. She started her own business. <laughs> you inspire me daily. I love you. And that's all I got. Raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Jennifer Salinas. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I freely and willing, willingly that I freely and willingly accept the position of national HNBA president that I accept the position of national HNBA president to uphold its bylaws to uphold its bylaws and policies and policies to conduct myself to conduct myself in a manner in a manner that brings honor that brings honor to the HNBA to the HNBA and to work diligently and to work diligently and selflessly and selflessly to fulfill the HNBA mission to fulfill the HNBA's mission so help me god so help me god congratulations Thank you.